Greetings, everyone. Uh, welcome to day, I've honestly lost count, of this shelter-in-place quarantine. Uh, I'm Steve, with the Carquinez Model Railroad Society. Uh, and to help keep everyone entertained during this period of extended boredom, uh, I have been asked by club management to talk a little bit today about a project I recently completed. And that project is this a little weathering job we did. Uh, this is hmm, an SD45T-2, a.k.a. Tunnel Motor, a name you should all be familiar with. If not, you haven't been paying attention. Um, which I recently completed. Uh, this was Athern, ready to roll, uh, primed for grime, actually. It was my first time doing a weathering project on one of those particular units, and honestly, I'm kind of impressed. The, uh, the pre-fading was nice. Uh, it took the weathering agents well. Uh, didn't require much in terms of surface prep. Um, it's all good, honestly. Very little, if anything, to complain about. So, um, we'll talk a little bit about this in the, in a second, I should say. But, um, before we do that, let's, uh, let's go into the history of the development of these units just a bit, because the development history informs how they were used and deployed in the real world, and the way in which they were deployed affects how they weathered. Uh, what they wound up looking like uh, while they were in service. And that, of course, determines our approach to the process. So we will start off with this, the initial version of the unit. Uh, the SD-45 was a turbocharged V-20, 645 cubic inches of displacement per cylinder, locomotive that produced 3,600 horsepower. These things were beasts, folks. Uh, they would pull everything in the yard, including the yard office, if you gave them a chance. Uh, this specific unit is actually an SDP-45, uh, which is a slight variation. Uh, it's actually designed to haul passenger trains, and uh, let's zoom in a bit here and I'll show you exactly what the differences are. Uh, biggest difference between one of these and a standard SD45 is right back here in the tail end. I'm going to center that up there. Uh, these units were equipped with a diesel fired boiler uh, because the passenger cars they were intended to pull were built during the steam locomotive era and still had steam heating. Uh, putting the railroads in the rather odd position of needing diesel locomotives capable of producing steam. So, irony. Uh, mainly, right here, the, well, the boiler was back in the back. That's why the uh, back end was squared off versus pointed, because they had to create extra room for it. And then you have the exhaust stack for the boiler, and then this little dome protrusion here was actually the air intake. Uh, other than that, uh, there were, on the tail end here, you see, uh, these little water transfer hoses. There and there. Uh, the purpose for that was if you had multiple units running together, you could hook them together and they could share their water supply. Really didn't work out that way. There wasn't much call for that sort of service. These engines typically ran solo. Uh, and in later years, these were actually removed. Uh, I think they basically just started to rot from disuse, and so the shop crews just pulled them off and threw them away. Uh, the only other difference is this little crossbar you see here. And then there's actually two more up here on either side of the cab roof. These were icebreakers. Uh, the purpose was to knock icicles off the tops of tunnel portals in the winter before the windows in your dome cars wound up taking care of that, uh, which tended to make things rather drafty down in the lounge. So, just little details that they added to uh, adapt it for passenger service. But for the most part, this was mechanically the same as a standard SD45. It's the same 3600 horsepower monster that they all were. 
uh, and they ran great. They were workhorses. But once they got into the long tunnels and the snow sheds up in the mountains, they ran into a problem, namely back here in the tail end. These grids here lead to the radiators for cooling the engine block. Kind of center that up there. Uh, air would be pulled in through here, pass over the, uh, the, the, uh, the coils of the radiator, and then be pulled out the top by these three fans. Normally that works fine. Until you get into the tunnels, and then you develop a problem up here in the form of this big honking turbocharged exhaust, which is superheating the air up near the tunnel roof, because heat rises, after all hot air which is then promptly pulled through the radiators by these fans here and tends to limit the effectiveness of your engine cooling. Now obviously this resulted in some problems, uh, namely overheating issues, uh, unwanted shutdowns, engines stalling out in the tunnels, it was just kind of a mess. So the engineering department at one Market Street in San Francisco put their minds to the problem and they came up with a solution. And that solution was this. What they called the Elephant Ear SD45. Uh, so named for these big honking sheet metal protrusions you see here on either side of the car body back at the tail end. Uh, the idea was that by adding all of this duct work, they could redirect the airflow, force the radiators to pull air from down lower, where it's cooler, and they would regain their cooling efficiency. Um, it kind of worked, basically. Um, it wasn't perfect. Uh, you could still get airflow from up high through the ends, like you see here. There's really nothing here to block it off. Um, and the crews did not like it. Uh, guys walking back to the tail end used to bang their heads on this all the time. I actually know a gentleman uh, who he's retired now, but for a lot of years he was a brakeman conductor on the SP out of Bakersfield. And they used to get these things uh, going up over to Hatchapi Pass. And he's kind of a big guy. He's about 6'2", 6'3", or so. Uh, and... Uh, to this day, he still claims he has dents in his forehead from these things. Every time you walk back to the tail end, he'd ring his own bell. So it was better than nothing, but it really didn't give them the, uh, the sort of results they wanted. Uh, so back to the drawing board. Uh, they looked at the problem again. And then somebody, probably the junior member of the engineering team, said, well, Rather than dealing with this whole sheet metal jungle up in here, uh, and by the way, there were actually two different versions of this. This was the, These were built by the SP in their own shops in Sacramento. EMD built some at the factory this way, but they were more rounded in the top, whereas these are more angular. So if you ever see one of these that's kind of has more of an arch to it, that's a, that's a factory build. Anyway, so uh, they looked at the problem, thought about a different solution, and then somebody said, well, rather than dealing with all this, why don't we simply move the intakes down low? And you can actually see here, you see there, you actually see air, you can see daylight through there, it, it's completely passed through. And at that point, the rest of the team probably said, well, pfft, duh, why didn't we think of this? So anyway, the idea here is that air is pulled through the intakes, down low, up through the fans, over the grills, and out the top. The other difference you notice here too is that you don't see the fans. The fans are actually underneath the radiator coils and they're pushing the air through rather than pulling it through. It's more efficient to do it that way. That's why if you look at your car, the fan is behind the radiator coils up in front, not in front of it. So, there's multiple levels they're learning on here. So, that is basically the general idea behind what they call the tunnel motor. So, what did we do 
for hours? Well, first of all, uh, let me point out uh, my preferred method of weathering is to work with chalk powders. I know a lot of people like to work with airbrushes, and I can honestly see that, but it just, I feel better working with powders. That's just me. Whatever your preferred method is, you know, you do you. So, anyway, um, I kind of tried to go for an effect where it was a little dirtier on top. Uh, I've seen it on some uh, Southern Pacific locomotives. Uh, where they're, it seems like because they're in the tunnels and all the soot and the gunk and the heat is kind of concentrated up high, they get nice and black on the top and then it fades more down toward the bottom. I kind of went for that. Uh, it honestly wound up being a little dirtier down low than I anticipated, but uh, I suppose that's uh, half the fun of modeling, honestly. Uh, is uh, not really knowing what it's going to look like until you're done and being just as surprised as uh, as everyone else is, ultimately. That's why it's art, I guess. It's a creative process. It's not a science. So, anyway, a uh, couple of things I tried to do here. Uh, get a little better focus there. Can you actually see that a little better? Yeah, that's pretty good. Okay, so, um, on the nose. Uh, you notice right across the peak of the nose, right where the SP is, uh, there's a little bit of a clean spot. Let me kind of shove that a little closer, so... Uh, there we go, a little better there. Keep trying to angle this up and remember the way I'm looking at the camera, everything's reversed. Um, this is something you would see on dirtier units. Basically, crews would typically board the locomotive uh, from the front steps, depending on which side was closest to the yard office. Uh, so, say the yard office was over here on this side, uh, they would have to climb on the steps here, and the door is over here, so they'd have to walk around and kind of come around the end. And the peak of the nose here, the point of that nose, forms something of a natural pinch point between that bulkhead and the railing here. So they'd kind of have to squeeze, there was a little gap they'd have to squeeze through there. And because railroaders tend to not be the most svelte individuals in the world, uh, no offense guys, but, you know, brutal honesty here, um, they kind of wind up doing a little bit of a belly wipe across the nose and it winds up getting a little bit of a clean spot, because apparently that works better than a squeegee. Um, the other thing, uh, let me get a little closer here even, hopefully the focus lock, lock will hold. Uh, on the windshields, I cut out little sweeps. I actually used uh, graph paper, so I would have some guidelines already on there. And I cut out little squares and then, you know, kind of cut them so they have a little bit of a a little bit of a sweep pattern to them. And I tucked them behind the windshield wipers before I spray painted, uh, or I, I sprayed dull coat to seal in the weathering agents. So the result is a filthy windshield with a little whoop, 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 clean spot in the center. So it looks like the windshield wipers have cleaned off a little spot there in the middle of the crud. Uh, the one exception is over here. Uh, this one, I actually laid the little paper sweep in front of it. I didn't tuck it in behind, so you still got a little bit of dull coat in behind it. And it kind of looks like the blade is busted and it's only making partial contact with the glass. So, just little things there that you'd see in real life. You try to create them as best you can on the model, just for that add, added little level of realism. Another little thing we did... I'm not sure how well you can see this, but I'm going to try and zoom in as best I can. The lighting here isn't great. Right here, right in there, kind of point out just below the steps, there's a little lighter patch you maybe see in the shadows there. That's a little bit of silver paint, which I thinned out and just kind of spread around in a little puddle almost. And that's because right next to it in here is the handbrake. And this is something you'd see on units that got a lot of heavy use. Um, guys would have to stand there, obviously, and tie the unit down when they needed to apply the handbrake. 
or release it thereafter. And they're standing there wrestling with it, shuffling their feet, trying to find a solid stance because you need a little leverage to work those things. They're not real loosey-goosey. you got to put some force into it. And over time, all that activity would wear the paint off the steel decking right in that one little spot. Uh, and you'd see the, the glint of the steel showing from underneath. Uh, units that have been out of service for a while will have a similar effect, except it'll be a rust stain because the, the steel is rusted over without the protection of the paint. But it's just a little detail element that kind of, you know, helps sell the effect of, uh, you know, this being an actual in-service unit that has been, as my father used to say, rode hard and put away wet. He had a way with words. Another little item of note is up on top here. Uh, these are the fans for the dynamic brake grids, which get rather hot when the engine's coming down a grade with a heavy load behind it. And over time, in real life, that heat will begin to blister the paint off the roof around the fans, and then once the steel is exposed, it's going to do what steel does when it's exposed to oxidation, and it's going to rust. So, um, we created the effect uh, using uh, a chisel tip nylon brush, similar to uh, this one here. In fact, actually, this one. This is the brush I used. And uh, rust-colored uh, tempera chalk powder and uh, a bonding agent, which uh, turned out to be a secretious substance of an oral nature... Uh, spit, okay? I, I spit on it. I used chalk and spit. And yes, I know it's gross, but I honestly haven't found another method that gives the same effect. So if anybody has a more hygienic suggestion, I'm all ears. Um, but yeah, we just sort of... Uh, here. It was just, you just, you, 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 you lick your, uh, your brush a little bit, get a little bit of chalk on it, and then just kind of like that, basically draw little streaks around, and then uh, clean the excess off the brush and kind of just work it in a bit. I actually had another brush with uh, stiffer bristles. I used to kind of spread it out and uh, just take some of the definition off the edges. So it blend the edges a little bit more into the the rest of the roof. Just a little color suggestion, more or less, of uh, some heat damage to the paint because uh, Dynamics did get rather toasty to the tune of like 3,000 degrees sometimes. Yeah, don't want to get near those things when they're running. Uh, the other, another, I should say, element uh, that I went with is back here in the radiator intakes. Uh, and those, I don't see how you can actually see that there. Um, I just took some more of that rust colored chalk powder and a really stiff bristle brush and just kind of worked it into the grills here. Uh, and then overshot it with dull coat to seal it down. Because there's a lot of airflow moving through here when these things are running full blast. And uh, the air will have other stuff in it too. Sand, dust, various types of grit. And over time, that's like a low-level sandblast that'll slowly take the paint off these grills, and then, once again, once the paint is gone, rust will be very quick to set in. Uh, same thing up on top here, if you kind of... Here, look at the colors. There's a little bit of reddish-brown in there. Not a lot. You don't want to overdo it. This is one of those less-is-more things. But just enough to give the suggestion uh, especially when you you see it next to the unaffected areas, the straight gray. Uh, it's a lot of weathering is not just the colors you use, it's the colors next to the colors you're using. And the contrast it creates will actually give you your effect more than just, you know, using more of a particular color. It, it, it's subtle, and it's it's an acquired skill, I guess. It's something you pick up over time, so... A uh, couple more items of note. Uh, let's see if I get the focus there. I added sand lines, as you see there. Um, just a little, uh, it's, a, it's a nylon button thread. 
actually is what I use. Uh, button thread is a little thicker than normal nylon sewing thread. Uh, and it uh, just, uh, actually I take it back, I think this is cotton. But uh, anyway, it button thread is thicker than regular sewing thread, so it's a better scale representation of the heavy rubber hoses that would be used for sand dispersion. Uh, just cut a little piece in there, and then I secured it top and bottom uh, with just a little dab of super glue from the underside of the frame down to the uh, bottom of the truck frame there. So, just a suggestion is all. And then the other thing is, uh, I think it actually shows up a little better on this side. Let's flip it around. Right under the, uh, there we go, spout for the, uh, the, the, the filler cap for the fuel tank, a little bit of brown chalk powder that I dull coated, and then I overbrushed it with some watered down gloss acrylic. So it looks like uh, last time they fueled it up, a little bit of diesel spilled out and kind of ran down the, the side of the tank and created uh, a little bit of a, 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 a slick there. There's a little bit of a sheen. So once again, just those little details that uh, just kind of help sell the effect. So. Other than that, uh, the only real serious details I can think of are the uh, faded and blistered lettering on the long hood, which was actually not me. That's part of the Prime for Grime thing that Atherin does, so credit where credit is due. And then up here, above the cab, um, one thing I've noticed over the years in a lot of photographs, and I have no idea why this is, but the sun visors tend to corrode faster than the rest of the cab roof does. Once again, it's in the same spot. They're both sheet metal. I don't know why the paint on these things seems to wear out and they rust out faster than anything else, but it seems to be a thing, so I just kind of rolled with it. I figure, you know, prototype is as prototype does. Who am I to, to judge or even try to understand it? So. So, that's the story of the SD45 T-2. Except that it isn't. Because it's never that simple, honestly. Um, the SD45, in all its variants, had a smaller cousin, as it turns out. The SD40 T-2. Basically the same overall unit. Uh, the main difference was that instead of a 20-cylinder... 3,600 horsepower engine block, the 40 only had a 16-cylinder, 3,000 horsepower block. It was the diet version of the SD45, if you want to call it that. Uh, and at some point in time, all the bean counters at One Market Street uh, decided to push their pencils around a bit and came to the conclusion that from a pure fuel economy standpoint, it made more sense to have SD40s instead of 45s and then just have more of them. Uh, sort of the railroading equivalent of save early, save often, you might say. So, uh, they went back to EMD and made their plight known, and EMD came out with this. Okay. Uh, Looks basically the same, doesn't it? I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a tunnel motor. There's your intakes there. There's your outflow for the radiators. Uh, fans are underneath, so they're hidden. Um, pretty much the same unit, right? Not quite. Um, this has the smaller block inside of it. This only has a V16 versus a V20. Uh, so. 600 fewer horsepower, four fewer cylinders, a lot more uh, fuel efficient in terms of the economy it's going to give you. Um, all well and good. How do you tell them apart? Well, that's where another one of those little waste not, want not issues comes in. Uh, because when EMD set about building these things, they realized that they still had a lot of frames left over from this from the SD45. And everything pretty much fit, so why not just use the frame from these to build these? Which they did. 
Makes economic sense after all. But those four cylinders you've lost earns you some extra real estate. What to do with that? And that is where we wind up with, or is how I should say, we wind up with what became known as the snoot nose. And to show you what I mean by that, uh, we'll do a side-by-side -side comparison here. This is the SD45. We'll line it up, we'll put the edge of the nose right there. Actually, we'll move it up a bit, right there. Okay. Now, here is the 40 T-2. Side by side, nose is even. Notice how much farther back the cab is here on the 40 versus the 45. You see that? Look at how much longer the nose is. In fact, we can even sort of, if I can grab them here, put them side by side there. Notice the difference, okay? There we go. Once again, this is simply because you had extra room on the frame now. And you gotta go, you gotta do something with it. Some versions of these units had uh, bigger porches front and back. Uh, most of them, though, just wound up with the larger nose. It was nice because it gave them some extra room for storage. And it also meant there was more room for the toilet up in here, which was a nice little creature comfort for the crews. The 45s, it was so cramped up in the nose here that some of the crews that worked on these things described as using the, using the restroom on these engines, they, they, they called it uh, taking a dump in a phone booth. Uh, there were logistical issues presented by the process. So this was a much preferable setup. Um, needless to say, if you were a head-end crew, engineer, or head brakeman, and you had your pick between a 40 and a 45, you'd pick the 40. So. so that's pretty much the story of the SD45 and all of its evolved variants. Uh, starting with the standard 45 in the beginning, uh, moving on to the elephant ear variant, when the cooling issues were first discovered. Um, then to the 45T-2, the first true tunnel motor, when the elephant ears proved eh, less than fully effective, shall we say. And then, of course, to the baby tunnel motor, SD40T-2, when they suddenly discovered that, lo and behold, diesel fuel cost money. Who knew? There you go. With your brethren and all ready for our next trip to the club. Whenever that turns out to be.